Clyde Grove State Park in Smolin, New York, this is Radio's Wally Baloo welcoming you to the annual Bob and Ray Employees Outing and uh, Clam Bay. It's a beautiful day here during the next quarter hour. My broadcasting complete partner, Artie Skirmahorn and I will try to bring you some of the color and some of the... Going on here at uh, no, uh, Pine Grove. Ray, Just a minute, please. Bob and, no. uh, Bob and Ray are due to arrive in any minute. They haven't uh, haven't made their appearance as yet. We're speaking to you from the improvised stage here at the edge of the picnic grounds. The smell of the pit in which the fire is being built to cook the clams uh, is wafting across this group of some 60 or 70 employees of Bob and Ray. The music you've listened to for the past few minutes has been supplied by oh, Claude and Clyde, the McBeady oh. twins of their orchestra, and I'd like to have you say Quiet. just a word uh, 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 to the maestros. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, we hope, we you, hope enjoyed you enjoyed our, our music, music, and, and uh, we, uh, we know, know it's always, it's always a, pleasure a pleasure to, to uh, uh, meet and mingle, mingle with, uh, with uh, all, all the great Bob, Bob and Ray employees. A lot of fun. Hope you enjoy the music, and... So long for now. now. I love their music. And as they make their way back to the band stand, we see no sign as yet. What's that? Bob and Ray. Where? Wally, could I interrupt you just a second? Artie Skirmahog, come in, please. Uh, I think, uh, Wally, that uh, there's a hog calling contest coming to a conclusion over here at the far end of the Pine Grove area. Uh, It seems to me that a group of Madison Avenue uh, hog fanciers uh, have come up here for a hog calling contest. Uh, They were only supposed to have the park for this morning. That's right. They were supposed to be out of here by noon. That's right. Well, maybe someone can... uh... Webley Webster, I wonder if you could go over and see if you could shoo them off a little bit. Okay. Well, I'll see what I can do. Anyway. I'll help you. Right uh, here, Artie, I wonder if you'd give me a hand uh, on our commercial for today's program. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're working under field conditions. It's a little bit difficult, but we will try to uh, include all of the elements of the Bob and Ray show until they arrive. I mean, it's hot. Uh, okay, then, uh, uh, Wally, uh, Artie Scrimahorn here. I might like to mention right now the Columbia Portable Phonograph. Now, you can carry the fun with you with a Columbia Stereophonic High Fidelity Portable Phonograph. I noticed uh, today that Clyde L. Half Wartney uh, brought up his uh, portable phonograph, and he's having a wonderful time over there under a tree. Well, anyone who has a Columbia (laughs) Stereophonic Portable Phonograph will have all of the fun of the best of music, the wonderful world of sound, with them wherever they go. And the prices are reasonable, too. They begin at only $24.95 for Columbia Portables. Uh, excuse me. Go well, ahead, Artie. Right. I just wanted to mention that they have that big console sound reproduced by Columbia Stereophonic High Fidelity Phonographs. So thrill to the excitement of Stereo One by Columbia. Number one in the wonderful world of sound. See them at your Columbia dealer today. Thanks, Artie Skirmahorn. And now, I see at the edge of the picnic grounds the Bob and Ray chauffeur driver. High-powered air conditioning limousine. Bob and Ray, come on. The word is getting around. Bob and Ray, Employees, rather. Play the regal music. Play the regal music with babies. Man, change the pit. Bob and Ray are waving as they drive slowly through, wending their way amongst the pine trees. And a generous round of applause. Pull up to the shady spot of the windows of the limousine. They're all closed tightly. I imagine to keep in the air-conditioned comfort which they've driven up here in. And right here, before we hear from Bob and Ray, who incidentally don't seem to be getting out of the limousine at this point, they must be making last-minute plans for their what they will say. Uh, excuse in their... me, Wally. Yes, uh, I might mention uh, I was just trying to uh, talk uh, with the babies here, estimating the temperature. Uh, I'd say that it was maybe 102 degrees here today with high humidity, uh, maybe uh, 98% or so. And, uh, and I think that... Uh, 
It's uh, the reason Bob and Ray are not getting out of their black uh, limousine is that it's an air-conditioned car. I think they're going to stay you in there. think they'll stay there for the whole show? I is that the, so. the word right. that's going around? The mosquitoes are so thick, I don't blame them. Right now, for a bit of the sports activity taking place here at Pine Grove Park, let's switch to the baseball field and Steve Bosco to bring you the featured last half of the seventh inning. Hi, everybody. This is Steve Bosco, all set to bring you the last half of the featured seventh inning, $20 added here. The game between the fat Bob and Ray employees and the skinny Bob and Ray employees. Uh, Chester Hasbrook Frisbee of the fat team is at bat now. Uh, Jack Headstrong is the skinny pitcher. He's uh, tossing him up to Chester now. Seems to be a little delay. I might point out uh, an unfortunate incident that uh, happened earlier in the second inning when Charles the Port uh, slid into second base for what appeared to be a two-base hit. Uh, the only thing was he stirred up a bit of a ruckus. He slid into a pole cat uh, that was sleeping on the other side of the second base bag, and they had to bury his skinny uniform. Uh, he's finishing out the game in his swimming trunks. Uh, Dr. Brittany Stoll is on first. He was hit in the head uh, by a high heart one uh, just a moment ago, so he's taking a very short lead off first. Chester Hasbrook Frisbee uh, swinging uh, his bat at the plate. Jack Hitstrong uh, winds up, and there's the pitch. The slow roller going down to second base. And this should be an easy double play ball. And, well, Robin Ray's the team has just come from uh, approximately the third base coach's line uh, up over the pitcher's mound. I think they probably nicked Jack Hitstrong and have uh, gone off to a shady spot in deep right field. Uh, I think that that probably will be the end of the ball game, the beach at seven. On this uh, happy note, I... Oh, it's a happy note. Yes, Jack Hitstrong is all right, and now they seem to be arguing down there that it was illegal that uh, Bob and Ray drove across the field, but it is their picnic. On this note, then, this is Steve Bosco rounding third, being thrown out at home. Back here at the entertainment uh, side of the uh, park, this is Wally Ballou again, and we're about to see some of the first of the acts lined up for today's fun. First of all, I'm going to call on my broadcasting uh, partner, Artie Skirmahorn, to help me describe the Cabot Brother and their flamenco dance. Artie? Well, uh, it uh, was billed as the Cabot Brothers. That's uh, what I thought. Fortunately, uh, Bruce uh, tripped and sprained his ankle in rehearsal, so it will be just Lenny. A hey, Cabot Brother. Just one. There he goes. He's on the stage now. I've never seen him uh, perform in quite this fashion before. Well, I... Uh, I uh, wouldn't like... It's almost as if he were staggering, Artie. Wouldn't you say I think so? exactly that's what he's doing. Uh, I... I wouldn't like to criticize of an act, but it appears to me that he's in bad shape. Get him off the stage. Somebody get Cyril Gore ready. He's going on early. Get that Cabot brother off before he hurts himself. The Cabot brother, a uh, flamenco dance act that has not gone over too Put well. Water on him. He'll be all right. But they're pouring water on him now. Coming up the steps to the stage now is one of the acts flown here from England. Go right on out, Cyril. Well, you need something to pep up the audience. A uh, great little talent, great little performer, Cyril Gore, flautist. And what are you going to give the folks, Cyril? It's too late. He's on the stage Oh, now. he's going into his number right now. There he goes. <laughs> Yes, I think we better get him off the stage before he... I don't think they'll stand much more of it. Cyril, you better get off the stage for your own good. We don't want too much trouble. Thank you very much. It's nice of you to come uh, this Artie far. Skirmahorn is escorting Mr. Gore to the rear of the platform now. Yeah, we'll and I think it would be a good time, ladies and gentlemen, if I may have your attention, to bring on the wealthy Jacobus Pike, chairman of the Bob and Ray Board. Will you get him for me, Artie? Uh, he Mr. is Pike. going to deliver the Mr. prepared Pike, announcement that Bob and Ray would have given uh, had they not uh, stayed in their limousine. You come right over here, Mr. Pike. He has a few pages of prepared copy there. And in just a moment, we will hear the uh, speech that they would have delivered. You need a microphone, Mr. Pike? No, I can just speak right up. Yes, uh, Bob and Ray employees, welcome to your annual company picnic. We hope you're having 
A cracker jack. Oh, a good time. Oh, you Bob and Ray want me to oh, extend to you well, their man. kindest yeah, regards and down. best Let wishes Pike talk on. for the coming year. We hope that in the future years that this family of ours will grow and that we will all prosper Hey, Pike, give it a crack, will you? I... Oh, Bob and Ray, a couple of cheesecakes. Oh, just a moment here. I don't think they are. Bob and Ray have driven here out of their way to make sure that this family of ours will prosper. Hey, Pike, give it a crack, will you? I just a moment here. I don't think they are. That is the very Bob and Ray have driven here out of their way. Who asked them to come? To come here. Hot dog, buddy. To grace your company picnic. I think the least you can do is be polite. Uh, food will be served in just a few moments. Tell that food. Thank right. you very much, you Mr. Pike. Stand back and be quiet. Let the old man finish. I'm all through. I'm I believe through. he is finished, uh, Webley. And uh, mm. very nice remarks, too, from uh, Jacobus Pike, uh, courtesy of uh, the two boys. It's a beautiful day here at Pine Grove uh, State Park in Spallen, New York. And we get back to the entertainment portion of our program before uh, turning to the uh, sandwiches and the clam bake. Wally, I think that uh, Tex Blaisdell, Bob and Ray's famous cowboy, is here with his dog act now to good, entertain good, the, wonderful. Uh, the crowd. So go right ahead, Tex. Time. Step right out. Go ahead. All right. Come on there, Scott. Now you on up and in your life. Through the barrels. There's a crack of thunder, Wally, to be followed by rain. Yes, it's... And Bob and Ray had just started the motor of their limousine. The chauffeur started the motor almost simultaneously with the first clap of thunder indicating a storm uh, overhead. A storm which certainly is going to dampen the spirits of some of the people there. I never thought they'd do anything like that, go off and leave us out here in the field in this pouring rain. Off they go in their closed yeah, limousine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Careful the birds, no doubt. Yeah, yeah. You might have known this the way it would have turned out. Ten fish it cost me to come up to this. And now I understand the bus driver's lost the keys to the bus. Oh, oh no. no. We'll be here till oh, next week sometime. And if they call this a state park, boy, we ought to get our taxes back. Maybe if some of those hog collars left, they'll drive us back to town. Well, that's about it, well, ladies and gentlemen. Artie, will you come over here and help me with the sign-off? I think our time is pretty near up. I think around. maybe if you uh, take off your jacket and put it over the microphone, uh, that they won't pick up too much of the, uh, the sound of the rain hitting at the mic. It's too bad that uh, such an auspicious day as this should end. Uh, what's that over there? Water moccasin? Yes. This uh, is a disgruntled, uh, unhappy group. Uh, I might point out at this time, it started off uh, in a very happy way, but now it seems to have more or less dwindled off into a catastrophe in public relations for Bob and Ray. Well, it's unfortunate that it should have turned out this way. I'm soaking wet. I, soaking wet. Is that a drip dry suit? No, it is not. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, we better sign off for them then, I guess. Yes, as they would say, uh, uh, this is Adi Skirmahorn, or uh, Ray Goulding, reminding you to write if you get work. And uh, Wally Ballou, for Bob Elliott, reminding you to hang by your thumb. This is the CBS Radio Network. Mary, what's all this stuff you've dumped on the desk here? Well, I don't think I what dumped it. it. I put it down in orderly procedure and form because it has to be used uh, in an orderly way. How do you mean? Bob, this, uh, these are the uh, parts of a new game that was sent down by the McTavish Game Company, and they wanted us to give it a, mes uh, oh. a mention. Oh, they're wonderful uh, game makers, certainly, the McTavish oh, yes, folks. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, 
We have uh, introduced other games in the past uh, years. I remember one called Duplication. Yes, you, you kind of swept the country the, that's there. That's right, about 1952, I think yes, you did that. Yes, it did. What is this one called? This one is called Have a Fun. Have a Fun. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, here, you use here... Can we play it here, or is it going to take too long? Because uh, we have a lot to do. Well, we, I think maybe it would be nice if... Uh, One round, maybe? Yeah, we played for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's the best way to learn any game. Could I play uh, two, Barry? Sure. sure any number I... can play. Uh, from two up to, I don't know, as many as you could well, get around the, the table. What would be the simplest way? Have four of us play... Ray well, you me. play. No, don't get Ray. And he always well, cries if he loses. He's good at games. No, though. he cries. All so right. let's not use him. You and... Uh, me, me, me. Who are you, Wally? Uh, yes. How about oh, me? Webley Webster? Sure. <laughs> no, you're not stupid, but you no, can No, don't play. say that, Webb. You're not oh, stupid. Oh, I always say that anyway. Well, you don't need to. Well, it's <clears> safer. Well, we know. People don't ask me to make any decisions when I come right out and tell them I'm stupid. All right, will you sit there at that side of the card table? Okay. And, uh, I'll oh, sorry, here. now you have you use a regular, ordinary here. deck of cards. Except, except, yeah. you use uh, all the jokers. All, you just use the jokers? Use them all, plus the other cards. Oh, I see, okay. So you use them all. Okay. And then you Who use deals? dice. Shall I? Oh, all right. The second we get these. All right. All right. Now deal, Bob. You deal and all deal right. three cards to each. Three cards each to each of the players. Right. That's three for you. No, no, not that way. Not that no, way. No, around. One, around. Two, okay. Around. That's right. Don't give them three like that because right. it's so easy to. Spend. All right. We've all got three now. All right, I've now got, take these. I've got four. Your fingers are sticky. Buddy. Well, hold. I'll, uh, right. I'll close my eyes and take one. Okay. Yeah, I'll put that back in the deck. All, all right. right, now do we all have three? I do, yes. I do. I do. One, two, three. And I have three. All right, now, uh, Wally, you take the dice and roll it. Okay. And roll them. Well, all right. Right out this way? Mm -hmm. uh, out of this piece of uh, velvet, huh? Right there, yes. Right, okay. All right. Well, uh, what's it? At six. six. All right. Now, does anyone have a six of clubs? No, I've got two jokers. I have. Well, now you fish in the deck. Fish until you get a nine. What do you mean, just keep going through the... Yes, and you have to keep all those cards. What's the jar of peanut butter for? That's a uh, party game, I think. Yes, is that it? comes later. All right, now spin the roulette wheel, uh, Webley. Go ahead, give it a good spin, Webb. All right, go ahead. Was it uh, wherever it's... Did right. you get the card you were fishing for? There's no the little deck? ball in the roulette wheel. Does that make any difference? No. Well, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's She's right. That. No, but you're supposed to have put the six you had in there before you spun the what roulette, the roulette wheel. wheel. Now the all I need is a small comb. Anyone have a small comb? I've got one here. Thank you. I want to comb my hair. Oh, I thought that was probably Well, how game. could you use a small comb no, in a game? No, that's silly, Wally. You wouldn't, wouldn't use that in a game. All right, now, who plays next? Oh, uh, I think it's me, isn't it? No, well, it's my turn. Clockwise, it would now, be Now, I take the putty knife... Yeah. ...and I dip it into the peanut butter jar... Mm -hmm. ...and I hold back the edge of the putty knife... ...and aim it towards the ceiling. All right. Now, sit back. Good shot. Well, we were lying oh, it down there. Fell off, eh? All right, Webley, you you won because he had the six right. He got the peanut butter, yes. and he spun the roulette six, wheel. Right. I don't know much more. I I don't think we're playing it right. Well, yeah, you, maybe you need to read the rules. I over think I better. It well, seems like it's kind of not. I'm sorry, but anyway, it's a nice game, and the kids will love it. And it's called Have a Fun, made by the McTavish folks. Always uh, can be counted upon for good games. Thanks for showing it to us. Entirely welcome. Time for Grand Motel, a speck of a place, a heck of a place, owned and operated by Leonard Humphrey, with an assist from his daughter, Naomi. So, let's get out to Hadleyville on Route 14. Naomi, business is the worst it's ever been at Grand Motel. It's so bad, I... I don't want you to see the books I keep on business. I want to protect you from the bad news. Dad, I... I know, I know, Naomi. You're going to ask me to let you see the books. Well, I won't do it because... Dad, the... I keep the books. I make all the entries. Uh, I'm sorry, Naomi. I wish I'd known. Naomi, what's the trouble? Grand Motel has seven spick-and-span cabins. Why can't we fill them? 
Dad, it's the service. Well, the service is real good here. Switchboard is open for at least an hour a day. New shoe shine rags in each room every day. Dad, it's the continental breakfast. Oh. People want to know that the breakfast is available. They'd also like to feel they can have it whenever they want. Naomi, I'm an old man. I've seen a lot. Know quite a bit, too. One of the things I know is this. Folks should eat breakfast between the hours of 6 and 9 in the morning. But, Dad, you have to be flexible in this modern day and age. You have to move with the times. I think you should serve the continental breakfast whenever people ask for it. Do it for me, Dad. Well, seeing as you're my daughter... Uh... Dad, a bus just pulled up. Huh? Go out and see what they want. And don't forget what I told you. Okay, Naomi. Pin a fresh carnation in my lapel, will you? Hey, is this a haunted house or does someone really run this joint? Don't get fresh, driver. I'm coming. I'm coming. Are you the owner of this palatial setup? Uh, that's right. My name's Humphrey. What's yours? Let's not get into personalities. Uh, look, I got a broken ac axle here, and the next town is 70 miles away, so it looks like we're going to have to bet up at your place. Can you accommodate 150 passengers? Sure. I got seven cabins. Works out to 20 to the cabin. I can accommodate them. Okay, all you passengers, let's go. Get off. I'm afraid we've got to stay here for tonight. All right, right this way, and I'll show you to your cabins. Once you get inside, if you have any trouble locating the faucets or the windows, call me at the switchboard, and I'll be happy to... Bus come... driver, ask that man if he serves continental breakfast. I heard you, ma'am. Yes, we serve a continental breakfast consisting of coffee and donuts, and we serve it at any hour. Okay, passengers, you heard them. Just tell them what time you want continental breakfast served. Come on, sing out. 1.30. Hold it, hold it. Let me get these times down now. 1.10.30, I want the continental breakfast now. Uh, well, ma'am, just as soon as I check you all in. I want it now. You said we could have it any time we wanted. I know, ma'am, but you can see the Passengers, problem. I think we should all stick together on this. This guy reneged on one promise, he's liable to do it again. Now, the axle on this bus is broken, but I'm all for pushing the bus 70 miles to the next town. What do you say, Padgett? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, oh, sure. Oh, but listen. Oh, all right, all right, put your backs to it, let's go. Oh, wait till Naomi hears about this. And so, a few more people are lost to the delights of Leonard Humphrey's establishment. Be with us again soon as Leonard Humphrey, with an assist from his daughter Naomi, tries to hold the economic fort at Grand Motel. Okay, Maxie, uh, get this and get it straight. We walk into the bank real cool, just like we belong there, see? And casual-like, we stroll over to the teller's window, the one on the left, and shove the note to the guy. The note says? Right there on it. It's got, uh, please, sir, would like to sign up for the bond a month plan. That's it, huh? The rest is gravy. They put those great U.S. savings bonds aside for as regular as clockwork. In about nine years, we'll blow town take a trip to Acapulco. Heat, nah? I mean, neat, huh? They'll call you Chicken Carruthers for nothing, Chief. We have such wonderful reaction to Wallace, uh, Wallace's singing. You remember Wallace is our small assistant. That we have uh, rehired him and dispatched him by a jet aircraft to the West Coast. To you remember Arthur yesterday Shrank? we gave Arthur Shrank two tickets to the West Coast, while the other one, or half of it, was used by Wallace. And Arthur Schrank was fit to be tied because he had hoped to take Mrs. Arthur Schrank. So that all went up the, uh, as they say, up the flu, I think. They're out there now, and uh, it's our very great pleasure to call uh, Arthur in for a report on the first appearance of the Bob and Ray trophy train for this, the year 1959. Nine, Bob. Nine. Mm. So if you're listening, Arthur, and if all of our communication things are working, come in, please. Arthur uh, Shrank, ladies and gentlemen, speaking from the rear platform of the... Hi, am I on? Hi, everybody. This is Arthur Shrank speaking from the rear platform of the Bob and Ray trophy train that has just pulled into a siding here in San Diego, California. Standing beside me is Mr. Jack Kiner of KFMB, Bob and Ray's CBS voice here in San Diego. And I might point out that all the folks who have gone through the train 
Uh, this is... Uh, have it. Hello, everybody. At the Shrank, everyone seems to like the trophy train and the little bit of Bob and Ray memorabilia that they see in there. I wonder if I, uh, if I might turn the microphone over now to Mr. Kiner of KFMB and uh, Jack Buddy. Mm. Uh, I wonder if you could ask some of the folks what they think about it. I'd be very uh, happy to, Arthur. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank... Uh your employers, Bob and Ray, for selecting uh, KFMB as the kickoff point for uh, the trophy train this year. Everyone seems to be particularly uh, pleased with what they've seen as they walk through here for 25 cents. Uh, I was speaking with a Mr. Nestor just a minute ago, and I, he said he would be glad to uh, talk on the radio. Uh, Mr. Nestor, what impressed you most about the uh, trophy train? Well, I uh, was quite impressed, uh, Mr. Kiner, with the, uh, the pictures or duplicates of the Bob and Ray High School diploma. I was quite taken with that. Uh-huh. And uh, I have purchased here at the far end of the train... A dollar and for a dollar and a quarter, a glossy photo of a young, of young Bob and Ray. It's very well, nice. it, uh, it's, it certainly looks different than they do now. I tell you, though, uh, the, I might have one criticism. I, uh, yes. uh, between the uh, the buying of these little tokens and the uh, and the hot dog, frankfurters and rolls and all, I think a, I think a, a expecting a person to spend uh, the uh, large part of a $10 bill when they come aboard the trophy Train. You've uh, separated yourself from nearly $10. Well, $8.90. Right. Uh, so if a fellow brings along a girlfriend or a child, uh, it's going to run them almost it's going to run, run into money. I'm sure that's uh, what uh, Bob and Ray figured. I've had uh, quite a few people comment on the display featuring Ray's nose clip that he used when he first took swimming lessons uh, back uh, when he was a boy. Uh, people have looked at that and liked it. Uh, Arthur, I think that's uh, the picture here then, and I understand you're about ready to pull out of the station. That's right. And uh, Bob and Ray, uh, Wallace looks swell. He's standing on the rear platform now. We're about to say goodbye to San Diego. Goodbye, Arthur Shrank. So long, everybody. Don't be Thank you, Wallace. Goodbye, goodbye. I wish you all a last goodbye. Thank you, Arthur Schrank, and uh, real thrilling news you had to report today, and our thanks to Jack Kiner out there and KFMB for the warm reception you were given. I think this is going to go over much better than uh, <laughs> Dave did. And I'll bet you that uh, so Wallace's morale that. has gone up 1,001%. You could tell by the timber of his voice. What is? Wallace's morale. Oh, yeah. Oh, really oh, gone sky he's high. He's good. singing. He's doing what he always wanted to do. Well, more power to him, and we'll be calling in the trophy train at its next stop later this week. This is the show on which we introduce a new feature called Salute the Honor City. From time to time, we're going to select, uh, by technical means, a city uh, around the country and salute it on the Bob and Ray Show. And we're ready for our Honor City salute number one. Bob, where is the... Uh... Where's the piece of paper with the name of the honor city? Can I give it to you? No. I did. I... Mm -hmm. Play the play a little longer, will you, musicians? Uh, no, all we sure have I here did. is the commercial for uh, Columbia Phonographs. I don't Let see me look through my paper. stuff here. Keep it going, will you, Marcus, for just a second? No, I don't have it. Either. Well, it was How about was... that pile of uh, paper? No, let me see. Oh, he's ending now. We got a. You know what it is, engineer? Uh, well. Uh, we lost the name of the city. Uh, we'll have to do it. We'll look it up and do it some, some other, other time. time. Sorry about it. Now it's time for Ace Willoughby, International Detective. The world is my beat. My passport is nothing more than a ticket to trouble. Senor Willoughby, good to see you again. What brings you down here? Well, Captain Otero, my client, 
in a certain matter is a Mr. L. Mr. L? But I thought he... I know, I know. So did everybody. But, Tara, would it surprise you to know that I have Mr. L's key? The key? Surprises you, doesn't it? Well, it's this way. The key means a lot to a great many people. Mr. L wants to know who they are. But how will you find them, Willoughby? Tara, I'm not going to find them. They're going to find me. I've already started things. I'm registered at the Panama Hotel as Ace Willoughby, care of Mr. L, keeper of the key. I think the hotel clerk noticed it, too. Willoughby, a word of caution. There are many who seek the key. Be careful. (laughs) Relax, Carlos. I can take care of myself. If anything comes up, I'm headed back to the hotel. And Carlos, you ought to take care of the flies around here. (laughs) We've been waiting for you. No, no sudden moves, Willoughby. This gun is pointed right at your arm. Well, there's quite a gang of you here. Maybe we should have a party. The key, Willoughby. Where is it? I never knew a crook who didn't want something. The key. What makes you think I'd be stupid enough to carry the key around with me? We can find out in a hurry, Willoughby. You crooks. (laughs) No finesse, no brains, just plain muscle. Now, if you fellows figure on roughing me up, just remember this. A guy who's unconscious is a guy who can't talk. Swede, Larry, Frenchie, Herman, Tex, Willis, Laws, Steve, Dutch. Go get him. Hey, 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 guys. Remember what I told you about an unconscious man. Ow! All right, all right, that's enough. That's enough. Back up and let me take a look at him. He looks unconscious to me. He is. Quickly, spirits of ammonia. I'll hold this under his nose. Uh, well, what happened? Where am I? Hmm. Will it be a few minutes ago? You said unconscious men don't talk. Well, if that's what I said, I meant it. Do you know what's in this bottle? What? Spirits of ammonia. We can keep smashing you around the room and waking you up any time we feel like it. That's something I didn't count on. <laughs> Look, I'll make a deal with you guys. You can have the key when they shovel snow on the equator. Swede, Larry, Frenchy... No, 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 all right, all right. No, wait a minute, all right, all right. All right, here's the key. <laughs> if I can't count on being unconscious, there's no sense in carrying out this charade at all. <laughs> sure good sense, Willoughby. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> A wise person in Spain once taught me that a man who overeats is a man who's had enough. Adios. Oh, let's see. I think we should have some music. Yeah. Yeah. And from coast to coast, now's the season the air is filled with all the action and thrills of that annual razzle-dazzle powerhouse pigskin parade. True, true, and there's many a TD being racked up each weekend as the big squads clash in colorful gridiron set tubes. Say, if you'd like to keep in the know when it comes to the plays and the players, the scores and the stories, if you'd like to meet some of the men behind those thrilling... What's that say? Big irons. <laughs> it's written by a girl. Who wrote this? Uh, big skin, big skin plays down there on the grid skin. Oh, no, it was a joke, and I didn't see it. Listen each Monday through Saturday night to CBS Radio Sports Time with Frank Gifford. Want to read the whole thing so we can get the full meaning of it and the humor in it? Hey, if you'd like to meet some of the men behind those thrilling pig iron plays down there on the grid skin, listen each Monday through Saturday night to CBS Radio Sports Time with Frank Gifford. Sportsland sports spotter Frank Gifford pounds the sports time beat with sports scores, sports stories, and sportsmen for you right here on CBS Radio Old Sports. Whatever happened to Mumbly Peg? And uh, with us here right now is one of your old friends, we like to think, and we know one of ours, Barry Campbell, star of stage, screen, well, movies, television, radio. Of the orchestra world, Barry. I wonder if you'd uh, sit in here with us a little bit, and we kind of 
Gotta cut up a few, uh, whatever it is we cut up. All right, uh, Bob. First uh-huh. of all, it's great to be back here with you, and, uh... Uh, you know, I always consider this my second, second home. home. Whenever no. I'm uh, I'm in New York, it's a uh, it's a must for me to come up and to say hello to both you fellows. Where were you uh, born, Barry? Actually, I don't think I've ever asked you that question. I don't think you ever have either. I was born in Terre Haute, an Indiana boy, huh? That's right. Uh, it's especially good that you came up here today because I know you had a rather trying evening yesterday, last night, with the opening of. Uh, the new show, The Big Conga. Some of you may have already read the reviews of it. Uh, suffice to say, they just weren't good. And we uh, thought maybe we'd get the story from you. Very kind, Bob. Uh, well, I was being it's a, uh, probably exaggerating when I said they weren't good. The biggest uh, turkey that I've ever been associated with. That's and, a, uh, that, that kind of adds to your string. Uh, you've had a string of bad luck. Uh, Bob, I've been in, let's see, uh, it's been, I think, 12 flops in a row, and uh, it's beginning to undermine my faith in myself. And you know, when a person starts to lose his faith in himself, he's losing a very important part of keeping his uh, mind in one shape. Well, let's not go into that drivel now. I mean, the thing uh, we want to find out about dribble. is I'm the... afraid I'm uh, going bananas as a result of all these flops. And yeah, the, well, I... You know, I've read these reviews... Can we reviews, concentrate on the one last night? I that... read them over and over and over, and I, uh, I talk to myself about it, and then uh, finally I'm convinced that I should go back to the theater, and then it's the same old trauma. Well, Ray and I have been tempted to uh, suggest uh, at various times that maybe you... Uh, should look into some other line of work. But anyway, the big conga uh, last night opened uh, here on Broadway. It was a musical, I understand. I'm sorry. Well, it was supposed to be a musical, uh, Bob, and uh, it was, but I don't know. You see, the same old problem. I didn't like the uh, the lead opposite me. Uh, you didn't like the leading lady, Barry Campbell? Oh, no, no, no. She, uh, she's awfully difficult to work with, and uh, she invented... Uh, the ego, I think. And uh, all during our... Uh, well, you've been teamed town. up with her before in, in the summer stock, I know. Three times. Three times. And it's always been disastrous. Uh, I, I, I don't know what to say. Well, now, uh, you have a, you have a tape, I understand, a recording of... Uh, I, uh, big number there last you night. You can use it. I didn't bring it over. Uh, I, I it just was sent over by the leading lady. Uh, well, I don't know uh, if she's trying to make you look foolish. Or well, of course she is. She's trying to show me up as being, uh, you know, no talent. Uh, this, uh, pati- what is it anyway? You, do you have any idea? Well, it's the scene where you were to do the uh, uh, big conga. number, uh, Let's Conga Up a Storm, Everybody. Yeah. I think was the title. Well, of we're down in our, uh, what we call our playroom rumpus room and uh there's a party I, going on there's a party all our friends and uh this was going to be your first singing role i understand that's right and uh the cue was uh i go over to my leading lady you should excuse the expression <laughs> <laughs> and say uh dear let's conger up a storm everybody which meant everybody in the rumpus in the room rump. should get up and conger along mm-hmm uh, what that's, ha- where, that's where the tape begins, I think, and then uh, you were to sing, right? Yeah. Well, what happened? I just couldn't get going on Well, you go ahead, play the Let's tape. Let's play the uh, tape, Joe Alonzo, and uh, here is a, a preview of, uh, or an, an afterthought of a Broadway show. Dear, let's conger up a storm. Everybody. <laughs> It's not the ballad, it's the conga number. The what? The conga number. Oh, boy. How's it go? Let's conga up a storm, everybody. Let, let... Two, three, four. Let's conga... One, two, three, four. Let's conga up... Come on, Campbell, let's get with it. Don't just stand there. Would you be be quiet? Maybe I could sing it. Let's conger up. Better roll down the curtain now. Curtain down, Joe. All right, 
I can cut it, uh, Joe. Thank you. I think that's all. It was mayhem at that point. I, I can tell by the recording there. Why, uh, why didn't you remember the song, Barry well, Campbell? Well, I was nervous, and uh, as I said, there was that friction going on all the time that unnerved me. Incidentally, the management uh, wanted me to be sure and tell people who had tickets for tonight and ensuing performances uh, that there'll be a refund. They can get their money back and... Uh, well, not entirely. About 70 cents on the dollar. Well, the curtain has fallen on the big conga, and our best wishes to you, Barry Campbell, on your Thank next you. theatrical venture. I'm going to need it, I know. And, uh... Thanks for dropping by. It's always a pleasure. Now then, Wally, uh, you have that tape? Yeah. All right, why don't you give it to Mr. Alonzo? Well, wake him up. Wake up, Mr. Alonzo. Joe. Joe Alonzo. Good boy. All right. You want to play the tape, now? We're going to play the, uh, the Wally Ballou tape, the one uh, that he made when he visited uh, the laboratory of Matthew E. Pulsifer. Okay, let it roll. Peeking from the laboratory of Dr. Matthew E. Pulsifer... And uh, about set for our first look at uh, Dr. Pulsifer's uh, invention, the Fact Datatron. Uh, doctor, I wonder if you could give us a little background material of the machine that we're going to see demonstrated uh, very pre pre presently here. Yes, well, uh, well, first of all, I want to welcome you here to the laboratory, uh, Mr. Ballou. Uh, this is a, uh, a computer machine that I have been working on for... Uh, 11, 12 years. That was after you gave up brain surgery, was it? Oh, yes, many years after that. Uh, now, what I do here is I can feed uh, certain information and data uh, to this machine. Uh-huh. And uh, then the, uh, the machine uh, more or less digests uh, this information that I feed it. And uh, it uh, gives you your answer within uh, certain limitations. Well, I mean, would it answer any question I wanted to uh, ask, or well, does it have that information within it? No, that's uh, one of the limitations. Uh, the questions have to be easy, something you could figure out in your own head. One of the bugs you're trying to get out of it, I understand. Yes, that's right. So then, uh, when the digested information uh, is completed, uh, it's returned uh, on cards, I presume. Wait. It uh, comes out through. Well, do you want to step over here? I'll I think show maybe you that the, would uh, be machine, the machine, Mr. Ballou. Easiest thing. <laughs> the fact datatron uh, is electrically powered, and uh, you see, it's right, plugged into the wall over right. there. Uh, right down here is where the answer will come out. In here is where I feed. Uh -huh. uh, the information, the data I was speaking about. Well, do you do that before or after the question is asked? Do you do it before? Before. And then uh, well, do you, you want to feed uh, some information into it, or then I'll ask a question. All right, well, let me open the door and I'll feed it the information. Mr. Pulsifer is shoveling mounds of information into the machine, and I hear an electric uh, current going on. Something is working in there. Well, it's beginning to uh, digest all that information, those two or three shovelfuls that I just put in there. Uh-huh. That should be enough to answer. Mm -hmm. Simple question. Uh, that's working in good shape. All right. All right. Now, uh, here's the question I'd like to ask the machine. Is it all ready? I think so, yes. The lights are on, so you, you ask it any question. Right. If a person was born November 1st, 1955, say, how old would he be on November 1st, 1965. Let's see, it'd be 10 years old. I well, well, let's see what the machine says. Well, it's 55 to 65. What's that mean? It, uh... There's a card coming out of the up. side of the machine. It said, uh, 11, question mark. Well, the answer is 10, I'm sure of that. Well, I'm going to put some more information in there anyway. Maybe it didn't have enough facts to go on. Yeah. I'll put plenty of information in this time, and then you can ask it a question. That's very good. That's easy for it, too. It, it, it seemed like an easy yes, question. Yes, that's a nice, easy question. All right, now... Do you want me to change it? No, 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 well, yes. Uh, kind of All very... Right, let me well, get wait that. a second, second. Let oh. it digest All right. this uh, information. All right. Is it ready now? Yes, it's ready to go. Now All right, here's question. a simple one. How old am I this year? Now, let's see what the machine says. Uh, it says 41, question no, mark? No, Well, there's another card coming out. 28? Uh, no. 35? No. It's getting warmer, though. 41. No, it guessed that before. It said that once before. Yes, it likes that. 59. No. 
10. No, no. That was the answer to the first question. It's, is, it, is it extrapolating now? Uh, Mr. Ballou, you can stay here a little longer with the machine if you want. I'm going to go upstairs. All right, this uh, is Radio's Wally Ballou. I'm a little disappointed with it. Returning you to our New York studios from the laboratory of Matthew E. Pulver. Well, that must have been some experience, Wally. Yes, it was. Did you enjoy the tape? Very, very much so. I had a chance so. to edit it before we played it, I he, thought. Uh, he sounds uh, like a very unusual person, this uh, Matthew Pulsifer. Yes, he does. Uh -huh. <laughs> all right. Aching my seat now, if you don't... All right, all right, Wally, fine. <laughs> Once again, Grand Motel, a speck of a place, a heck of a place, owned and run by Leonard Humphrey. Now, in the last episode, a rueful Leonard Humphrey lost a busload of passengers because of his bad business habits. So this week, Leonard and Mr. E.S. Carfley, the famous motel efficiency expert, flown in to look things over. And... That's it, Mr. Carfley. I was getting ready to mm. check in 150 bus passengers when this lady asked for her continental breakfast on the spot. Mm. When I wouldn't give it to her, the bus driver got mad and had all the passengers push the bus 70 miles to the next town. Yeah. Well, uh, what does your continental breakfast consist of, Humphrey? Uh, donuts and coffee. Uh, give me a second to think about this. Uh... Humphrey, how's the coffee served? In a container or a cup? I serve the coffee in a container, Mr. Carpley. The drinker gets three lumps of sugar and a stirring stick, plus the donuts, of course. Uh, how long is the uh, stirring stick, Humphrey? Oh, about six inches, I'd say. Well, if you cut the uh, stick down to three inches, you could cut costs immediately on that. You think so, Mr. Carpley? Well, how many stirring sticks uh, do you have on hand, Humphrey? About uh, 8,000, I guess. Well, I think the number of uh, stirring sticks you have on hand warrants you're taking them to a sawmill for cutting. Well, the coffee containers run five inches high. Don't you think the stirring stick should uh, be a little too short that way? Well, uh, look, Humphrey, I'm trying to cut costs here. Do you have uh, one of the sticks handy? Yeah, right in my pocket here. I'm going to snap this thing in half, like so. Now, where do you keep the hot coffee and donuts? Uh, I keep that stuff uh, right next to the highway. I learned my lesson with impatient people. Uh, Humphrey, the next car that rolls in here, if the people should happen to want the continental breakfast right away, I'd like to, uh, I'd like you to give it to them. Yeah. And to give them this three-inch stirring stick, too, see? And I'll stay in the background and watch. Okay, Mr. Carpley. I think one's coming in now. Say, do you know where the Best View Motel is, mister? I sure do, ma'am. It's about three miles up the road, but I think I ought to tell you that they don't serve no continental breakfast. Well, do you serve continental breakfast here? Yes, ma'am. We serve a continental breakfast consisting of donuts and coffee at the Grand Motel. Care for some? Well, it's 9 p.m., but you're so hospitable, I think I will have some. All right, here she is, piping hot coffee. All I got to do is pour it in the container. All right, it looks good. How many sugars, ma'am? Two sugars. Right. Here she is, all ready to drink. And here's the donuts. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> do you have something I can use to stir the sugar in the coffee? Certainly, ma'am. Take this stirring stick here. Well, it looks a little short. I'm sure it'll do the job, lady. You go ahead and stir. All right. Ow! <laughs> My fingers went in the hot coffee. Mercy, it hurts. If I didn't have to be in Arizona by Thursday, I'd stay and sue you. Goodbye. Hey, Carpley, did you hear that? Yeah, now, Humphrey, if we cut down the containers, uh, Nancy... Get could... out of here, Carpley. All right, sir. And don't come back. I'm sending a bill, though. Wait till my daughter Naomi gets back from town and hears about this. And so Leonard Humphrey is thwarted again in his attempts to put Grand Motel back on its feet. Be with us again soon as he mulls over the idea of renovation. I have a wonderful book that I wanted to review for those who are interested in literature. For those who are interested in literature, yes. You don't have to translate from there. Well, I just got a little... Think what I'm telling up. All right, well, what is the Think book? Oh, we understand what I said it. 
I was on the line. All right, now you're getting excited, and uh, that doesn't pay. What is the book you're going to review? I uh, am going to review A Treasury of Great American Speeches. Is that a new publication? I'm not familiar with it. Yes, it is. Brand new, just out. All right, A Treasury of Great American Speeches. 595. And uh, it's great speeches. And uh, the World well, Wealthy Wealthy players are downstairs in the studio all set to reenact one of the best speeches in the whole book. Well, this should be different anyway. Let's hear what they have to give us, huh? All right, go ahead, actors. Matey? Hi, I said. The ocean looked mighty blue today. And calm, too, if I may say so, sir. Why, you... Oh, oh, oh. Oh, begging your pardon, Captain. You call that a calm sea, mate? Well, it seems to be running calm, sir. Why, you... Oh, 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 oh. oh. Did you hit the deck, matey lad? I did, sir. Here, let me help you up. Oh, thank you, Captain. Now then, mate. We've been to sea almost 11 days now. Where be we heading? Put out here on the good chart. I think it's time you opened the sealed orders, sir. None of us know where we'd be heading for. Why? speech could that possibly have been? So there you have it. The Treasury of Great American Speeches, five ninety five on sale at your bookstore. Hey, Webb, would you stand over there just a second? Yeah. Move back right, about three paces. Right in the circle there. Yeah. would be good. Kind of keep that big smile on your face. I want to take your picture. Okay? Swell. Oh, come <laughs> on! <laughs> Holy! Look, you deserved it, didn't you? Boy, it's the second suit in two weeks. Well, Do you know the cleaners wouldn't get all the egg out of the other suit? No, it's very difficult for a I have to that. use that to clean the car work. Yeah. Well, you've got another one to clean the car Oh, I'm telling you, I don't know why I stay on this program. It's a turkey anyway. And now, Chocolate Cookies with White Stuff in Between Them brings you another episode of Lawrence Fechtenberger, Interstellar Officer Candidate. It's late evening in the cell occupied by Lawrence Fechtenberger and his companion, Mug Mellish, at the Interstellar Space Academy Hospital. Convinced that they will never be released until they can prove they saw little people on the planet Polaris, Lawrence and Mug have planned to make an escape. If we join them, we hear... All right now, Mellish. Yeah? We need your full cooperation this time. Well, I'll... If you're going to do any sneering, Wait until we get out of this place. <laughs> okay, Fechtenberg, I'll hold up on the sneering. <laughs> Here's the plan now. Yeah. Jed Ordway. She's my... She's your girlfriend, isn't it, Fechtenberg? She's my betrothed. She is waiting out by the pad. Yeah? And uh, she has... Uh, wait, wait, wait. I think I hear a guard walking down the hall. One o'clock and all is well. I'm still sneering at 1 a.m., Alice. Oh, boy. I'm sneering at my sleep, God. Come over here, will you, God? The plan goes into effect now. Yes? What did you want? Why don't you go to sleep, Fechtenberger? It's that uh, cell across the hall, God. Uh, turn around. Oh? Okay. I got our keys, Lawrence. Okay. Open the place. All right. Get out of here. Boy, that worked neat. <laughs> Nobody else woke up. Come either. on, let's go. Let's yeah, go. let's hurry up. Darn, there would be a full moon. It's like mm, mid noon here. Yeah, but if we work fast. All right, stay in the shadows. Right over to the uh, launching pad. Jet! Jet! 
Yes. Oh, Chet. Yes. Here we are. We broke out. Okay. The ship's all ready to go. Okay. Hey, look, uh, when we get aboard, let's eliminate the tin cup. Let's start at five to right down. Yeah, that'll make it faster. We're in a rush. Come on up these steps. I can't go with you, boys. I'm sorry. You can't go, Chet? No, no. I'd love to. I'll try to cover your tracks as best I can. Sure, that's going to discourage Lawrence a great deal. <laughs> we'll be back. All we're going to do is go up to Polaris, get one of those little men, and return, Jet. Yeah, we'll prove to the dean that we've really seen him the first right, time. Stand fast. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Last off. Good. So in an effort to prove that they really had seen people on the planet Polaris, Lawrence and Mug make away with one of the Space Academy's rocket ships and head again for Polaris. Sure and join us in our next episode when we'll hear Lawrence say, Hey, look at the back of the moon. It's not so good, huh? In the next exciting episode of Lawrence Fechtenberger, Interstellar Officer Candidate.